in the next five years, five to ten, depending on how long you want to hold property. Yeah? Um, the Vice President of Facilities Management, Daniel Alfonso, is on his way. He will join us about 8.30, 9 o'clock. He will take over and gives you actually an idea of what's going on with real estate development and facilities management on a campus. We have been talking about student housing here and there in projects and also here in this class. Well, let's take a look at the real student housing, aka the dorms. <laughs> Most of you might know from the um, uh, orientation in last August, we're building brand new uh, dorm towers here on the um, campus, and we're going to visit them, revisit them again. So last time you've been there, everything was dirt, just the first level was uh, concrete, second floor was just coming up, not accessible at all. You have been probably passing that campus or the corner of campus a few times. There are now seven floors high, classes in. They are nicely looking, and we are actually getting a site tour. Huh? The reason why I said, hey, I'm fighting lunch already is because we have a 12.30 afternoon session. Huh? So the idea is to 10-ish, 10.30. Weather depending, right now it's beautiful outside. Double checking with Daniel about can we walk there? Is it accessible straight through campus right now? Or are we just doing a quick carpool ridiculously and just do a swing around campus? I think this might be actually the faster way, particularly after the site visit, we're doing a lunch break. So for those who have been wandering out to food places outside, that might be an ideal situation. So we'll have this in class as a decision. Um, I, the afternoon, we're going to have um, four speakers coming in. One is so eager to speak to you, he already brought uh, bagels and donuts. <laughs> He's already here. Yeah, Angelo Menendez. Um, we have two board members coming and an alumni as well. It's going to be an interesting mix of experiences and an inter interesting mix of where they are in their careers and how they started in their careers. Not everyone who graduates from a master's program in the US is 24, 25. Some people come back with 40, 50. So we have that reflection going on. Uh, and I asked Ken Stiles to reflect a little bit this afternoon on legacy. If you are third generation in the business, how you run things differently or is it just the same? So we asked him to talk about the philosophy and the character of styles, not just the organization. Yeah? So that's going to be a really interesting thing. Um, really thrilled about it. Um, schedule was tough to get him in, so I rocked it. Confirmed on Thursday evening. Um, that all said, speaking of confirmation, one of the first speakers confirmed was Marcella. And the reason why she was confirmed is because I told her, this is what you're going to do. <laughs> Um, the university had a concept we call the Directed Independent Study. Yeah? Uh, the reason why I say we had that concept is because we are abandoning for administrative purposes. So Marcella <coughs> had, a, can I say a problem? She wanted to finish early. Yeah? One class missing. And uh, we looked at the schedule and we basically said, okay, fine. Can we deliver, can we present an interesting, hard-working class for that concept? And I'm um, like, yeah, fine, sure, we can talk about that. And the first thing I ask her, what do you want to do? And she's like, hmm, I'm interested in a few topics, because I basically gave her the idea of this is special topics, it's a really like a special ops operation thing, not just a regular class. And what we ended up with is 
that was around November, Christmas, November? Late Yeah, so I told you, why don't you come up with three ideas? This is going to be a graduate level st uh, study, aka other universities call it a master thesis or an analytical paper. Yeah? So I, came, I told you, why don't you come up with three ideas, passwords? Okay, she did. Then I turned around and said, well, why don't you write a page for each of them and el eliminate in the process one of the topics? She did. And about two or three weeks later, I'm like, okay, fine, is this the one you really want? And she's like, yeah. All right, write more than that page. And then in early January, to give you an idea of what you're going to see today, early January, we set up a schedule and methods how she has to comb through literature and materials. And I think she did an outstanding job with that. I literally had her do a graduate thesis literature review. So this young lady over there wrote about 30 pages single space just on the background information on her topic. So I consider her the expert in the room on this topic. Um, how many references did you read? How many references did you use? I used about 43 references. But you read by but 100. I read about 60 or yeah. 60 So to give you an idea in terms of how you condense this down, you look at <coughs> all the puzzle pieces, but some do not add up for you a part of the story. Okay? Um, and she wrote this topic, Healthy Buildings in Broward County, with the idea of what's going on on the national stage general concept, national stage, and trickle that down with a focus down in Broward County, if this is feasible. Yeah? This is not a complete work yet. She has about a week to finish. Yeah? But we are in copy editing and layout and everything else is fine. Again, this is a knowledge-based building work. This is not a recommendation, do this, do that. Yeah? This is also the representation of extremely hard work. Yeah? Just for that, she actually earns an applause. Um, the idea to put this up was also to say, knowledge, generate knowledge, condense it, and then distribute it. Tell people about the great work. So you're the first ones to actually hear, see, and listen what she is actually has done in the last six months, four, five, four, by the end of April, five, about five. What she has done in that, I think it's really impressive. Um, she should not be shy to present her work. Um, it's harder to get her to present her awesome work than to actually get her to read 60 different references and reports. Yeah. So that all said, Marcella, um, she is the director of operations of Kaplan uh, since about five years, four and a half, five years in, on the uh, team. Took over in 2018 with a promotion for direct, directors of operations in the middle of a master's program here. So, and you will I, if you look at the web page, at the speaker bios, there's a link on the bottom for that. You I recently featured one of her current projects in Atlanta as an inside scoop. So, very impressive work. I'm looking really forward to see what you have. Take a few minutes to read, it's really interesting. Well, they had that up last since a week, so I oh, okay. <laughs> asked some questions. Speaking of questions, homework assignment from last week. Meet a fellow classmate and talk to them about things they want to do in career or in life. Have you talked to someone else in the classroom? You ever talked before? Good. Is she going on summer vacation? Did she tell you that? We didn't no, just kidding. Who else? Who else? You left early. Who did you talk to? I met with these two gentlemen right here. We kind of met with, but not in the context of just kind of free flowing. All right. How about you, Oz? I'm Brian. Cool. Hi. Adam? Well, pick Mike, talk to him. Mike, Mike is the guy in front of you. <laughs> huh? Same thing. We heard about networking and staying in contact with classmates and meeting your classmates every session we had so far. Uh, so do not underestimate the power of networking in the classroom. 
Yeah? Have that one conversation, that two conversations, it doesn't have to be a whole day, just a cup of coffee. All right? That all set? It's all yours. Enjoy. Good morning, everybody. Most of you already know me, but for those who don't, my name is Marcel. Um, I started the program in January 2018, and as the professor just mentioned, this is going to be my last presentation. I'm going to be graduating in Here in this program, the last Here, one. exactly. Here in this program. <laughs> um, graduating in June. Um, the reason why I picked this topic, uh, just to give you a little bit of background, uh, when I did my real estate development process part two class, I did my project on container housing. And I became interested in this alternative and uh, all the good things that you can do for communities where you work in. So when I was uh, narrowing down my, my topic, I thought, okay, this is a really cool idea, it's a different concept, it's not something to mention. So that was one of the reasons why I chose this topic. Um, I've been working for a real estate developer for the past five years, and part of what I do is that I help with due diligence, I go through the entitlement process, I do cash flows, uh, I keep track of pursuit costs, um, I keep constant contact with um, contractors and architects, engineers. So I basically have to help my team put everything together and do timelines and get the project from just a concept into a reality, get it entitled. So that's part of what I do. Uh, um, so I really hope that you guys enjoy this topic, enjoy the presentation, and that you learn a little bit about it. When I started, um, researching and I started talking to people in the industry, I noticed that not everybody is aware of what a healthy building is. There's misconceptions. Some people even think that this is the same as a green building. And even though there are some features that are really, um, that you can say are similar or that overlap, they're not the same. And I'm going to explain during my presentation what they are, some benefits that you can get as, a, as an occupant, uh, some challenges for you as a developer uh, if you try to come up with this concept and put it into reality. And I also took a look at, and I answered the question, is this a good investment option? And finally, we're going to uh, go into Broward County. So what is a healthy deal? For me to answer that question, I had to do a little research, a lot of background, and we must acknowledge that health issues are on the rise. They have been on the rise for the past few decades and we see more cases of death from chronic diseases, heart problems at an early age, obesity, mental issues, um, depression, stress-related issues, and so on. So as early as the 1900s, planners are started, they started um, bringing the concepts of health and wellness into the design of communities and of building specific. Uh, by the 1970s, they have brought in concepts such as urban farming, community gardens. By the 1980s, they brought the concept of mixed use, transit-oriented development, smart growth, and then by the 2000s, they introduced the concepts of wellness, real lifestyle, real estate, which was about designing your buildings your residences, office spaces, communities, with the focus of the health and wellness of its occupants. So to summarize, a healthy building is a building that is designed and incorporates into its design features that promote and improve the physical and mental health of its occupants. Having said this, why do we need healthy buildings? So studies and evidence uh, from buildings that have already incorporated all these standards uh, have identified some of the benefits includes uh, reduction in health problems, uh, they have been able to help people prevent chronic diseases, mental problems, address issues with sleep problems, uh, a reduction in stress levels, illnesses and absenteeism at work specifically people end up adopting healthy habits, 
uh, and all these social areas that healthy buildings provide help with the social well-being of communities. Uh, in the case specifically of workspaces, we see that employees are happy, they feel comfortable, they want to be at their workplace. So that increases productivity, creativity, and overall, they improve workplace satisfaction. <coughs> In the next couple of slides, I'm going to be showing you some images so that you can uh, visualize what I'm going to be explaining about the features of healthy buildings. So this is basically the details of what makes a healthy building. Air quality and ventilation are the first two features. Air quality is about providing cleaner air for occupants. And they do this by adopting policies that promote air quality and by using materials that help reduce allergens, dust, contaminants, toxins. So it's pretty similar to what green buildings do, that they want to provide something clean, they want to use cleaner materials. So one of the reasons why they do this is to reduce allergies, reduce eye irritation, improve overall your physical health. Some strategies are used, as you can see right here, right here. Uh, it's using uh, living walls because they absorb the air and they filter it the natural way. They also use um, air filters around the, the building. They use non-smoking policies, both indoors and outdoors, and they try to replace or use materials that would help reduce contaminants. So they will have walk-off mats by the building entrance. They will replace carpet with hardwood. Uh, ventilation is tied together with air quality. It goes hand to hand. So ventilation is about providing comfort for the occupant. It's about bringing clean air from the outside through windows or through other systems and filtering it and then delivering that clean air to occupants. Uh, some other things that ventilation is about is controlling temperature, controlling humidity, controlling air pressure, because those are things that make you uncomfortable when you're in the building. A poorly ventilated space can cause fatigue, can cause headaches, nausea, eye irritation. Do you know how how they get the wall to grow like that? <laughs> they use special systems in the background so that they can keep those alive. Talk to me later about it. Okay. I have some insights. <laughs> okay. Yeah. That's really cool. Yeah, I know it's it's really cool. Um, so the term green buildings is something how is that narrowly defined in the industry, what it is, and then is there a clear distinction? I, I don't want to skip ahead, but you kind of reference green buildings, and I kind of can't go there. Okay, so green buildings are designed, uh, or they use materials that create cleaner air, um, better water quality, which are some things that healthy buildings also do, but they are not the same. Because healthy buildings is mostly about the design. It you, it's also incorporating some um, filtering um, systems and stuff like that, but it's it's not it's not the same. It's used, <laughs> but it, there is a distinction between them. To to make this short, it doesn't have to be a lead standard building to be healthy. Correct. You could be still waste energy Correct. with the constru with with the architecture of the building, but you could um, provide a healthier or healthy building style environment. Right. Yeah. You don't have to go through the certification. You can incorporate some Without things. seeking that extra. And pot. some some buildings are already kind of trying to do this. Maybe they don't know, but they are they are already incorporating some of these features, but they don't certify. Mm -hmm. and then <laughs> I lost track. Um, so ventilation, so yeah, so it helps with fatigue, it helps with headaches, it helps with nausea, eye irritation, and overall it creates this feeling of comfort. Some buildings, uh, especially office buildings, use systems that will um, measure the, air, the temperature in a room. So when you walk in, you don't feel that it's too cold or too warm. They, they level the temperature so that it's the right temperature for that time of the day or for that time of the year and those are things that really make you feel comfortable as an occupant. The next uh, features are lighting and views. 
this is about providing the light, right amount of light for you to feel comfortable and the right amount of views so that you feel relaxed. So this is mostly about mental health, but it also helps with physical health. Um, studies have shown that the right amount of lighting can help you with eye problems, it helps you with myopia if you have it, um, it helps with depression, it helps you go to sleep. Um, views help you relax your mind. If you are at your workplace and you look through a window, uh, you may be more creative, you feel at ease, you feel more comfortable. So some of the strategies that healthy buildings use to achieve all of this, uh, they have big windows as you can see right there. You see a lot of daylight coming in on these pictures. High ceilings so that the uh, areas look bigger. They use um, light bulbs that can be dim because there has been studies showing that um, there is a need for your brain to have a specific type of light so that it works uh, properly and if you are at your workplace, it provides, it provides you for a more, um, it gives you the chance to be more productive and to concentrate better. Um, it helps you if you have problems reading, the right amount of light helps you. Um, if you have problems sleeping, um, there have been studies shown that there is a specific type of white light that you need in your bedroom so that your brain goes into this state where you want to go to sleep. So those are things that all these healthy buildings address. Not necessarily all of them, but they incorporate these features in there. And um, they create that feeling of comfort as well. Is there like a, a, like a central design authority? For, uh, for healthy buildings or? Well, you design them, there is a limited number of architects and designers and engineers that have been kind of what you will say certified that have gone through the education to be able to design this building. And those are regulated by two specific uh, entities that I will touch on a little bit later on. Um, but the answer will be yes. Thank you. <laughs> the next feature is noise control. So that's a really cool wall. <laughs> and that's basically one of the most interesting uh, features that help the buildings use. They incorporate a lot of living walls, both in the interior and the exterior, even on rooftops, so that they can absorb noise. And they do it on a natural way. They, of course, insulate the walls. But this is one of the most used features in healthy buildings, as far as noise. And that helps, of course, I mean, noise disrupts your communication, disrupts your concentration, disrupts um, your productivity. If you're at work, you get distracted. I mean, if you're at home, you, if you hear a lot of noise, you may not be able to sleep or to concentrate. So those are the reasons why they do this and they try to provide the right amount of um, noise control. The next features are promoting healthy food and water. This, of course, is done to help people uh, adopt a healthy eating habits. So they do this by incorporating community gardens, water stations, refilling stations. In the case of mixed-use buildings, they try to promote or bring uh, retail that promotes healthy food options, um, a grocery store, uh, organic food, promoting having farmers markets, uh, in the case of office buildings, they replace vending machines, like the regular vending machines, with machines that will provide healthy snacks. They have uh, kitchens, uh, cooking classes. Uh, if you have a cafeteria in your office building, then you offer healthy food options. And you promote them through water by making uh, water stations and refilling stations available throughout the building and out outside as well. So that's, it becomes your first choice. Uh, this is one of the most popular uh, features of healthy buildings. And it's about promoting physical activity. Um, some of the strategies that they use is that they make their buildings walkable. They provide walking trails, biking trails, biking storage, uh, especially in office buildings. Um, they provide gyms at office buildings so that people are encouraged to work out before starting their shift or after the shift. 
Uh, and one of the most uh, interesting features is the stairs. The way that they design the stairs is that they make them the main focus when you walk into the building. So you are motivated to use the stairs versus using the elevator. Mm -hmm. And you do this by using um, material that is attractive, you can make it colorful, you use glass, you use art around the world, walls, I'm sorry. And then uh, it motivates you, it makes them attractive so that you, you say, oh, okay, this is a nice staircase. And then because it's the first thing that you see, it makes you want to take it. It's all <laughs> about the design. Then the next features are overall health and wellness. And it's about providing comfort, it's about providing social area, it's about um, making feel people good. So in both office and residential buildings, they have areas for people socialize, where they have views to nature, they incorporate some green around this area so that people feel um, around nature more. And they have playgrounds for kids so that they start playing with each other and socializing at an early age, whereas the parents can talk to each other. They create areas where people can work out together. So this is mostly about mental health and making fe people feel well, feel good about themselves, feel uncomfortable. Maybe relax if you're at work, go out, take a quick break, and talk to uh, your co-worker or somebody around you. And the last uh, feature of healthy building is water quality. Uh, this one ties together with what I mentioned before about healthy food and water, and it's about providing water that is clean. So you're not afraid of drinking tap water that is contaminated. So some of the features, of course, is filtering the water, testing the water on a regular basis. In the case of redevelopment, you replace the entire infrastructure, so you provide something new, and then you know that it's going to be uh, clean. And of course, again, having water stations and refilling stations, indoor, outdoor, at least you're in an office building at different levels of the building and different places of the building. So you make uh, clean water available for people. Now, moving on to the standards. There are two major standards in the industry. We have well and we have fit well. Well was designed in 2011 by a company called Delos which is a technology firm. Uh, it was released officially in 2014. And it, it's currently managed by the entity called the International Well Building Institute. It has seven categories in their scoring card. And they go from water quality, air quality, fitness, mind, comfort, etc. cetera. Um, then we have Fitwell. Fitwell was designed in 2012 in between a partnership with the United States Center for Disease Control and the city of New York because they wanted to bring to New York all these healthy concepts to improve uh, overall wellness and I mean wellness for, for the citizens. So they have 12 categories in the sporting card and they go from location to snacks and machines to workplaces, to fitness level, um, they categorize them differently. And even though FITWELL has 12 categories, which is more than well, doesn't necessarily mean that it's harder to achieve. In fact, a lot of um, professionals in the industry state that it is harder to achieve a WELL certification rather than a FITWELL. And it's because uh, when you read into the details under each category, they they really go into, into detail as far as what they what they are scoring, whereas fit well is a little bit more general. Uh, all right. So after I went through all the concepts and I analyzed all the pros, I had to I had to think back and say, okay, there. What are the challenges that you can find as a developer? People want to kind of bring in this concept. So basically, the fact that the concept has not been widely adopted around the United States, even though there are a lot of these buildings around, and not only here, but also abroad, um, means there is a limited information available for you to use. So as a developer, you all know, you need a lot of information. You need to 
uh, have access to comparables. You need to define your costs. You need to be able to, to know how your building is going to perform. So the fact that there is limited number of buildings, and in some markets there is none, uh, it poses a challenge for you as a developer. And you need to do more research and dig in a little bit more for you to um, do your feasibility studies. Then, again, because there are not many buildings in the United States, it also means there are not a lot of consultants that can help you with this. So as far as architects, engineers, uh, general contractors, there is a limited number of them that can help you build a healthy building, or that have done the studies and that have reached out to well or fit well to be certified, so to say, to do this. So. For some developers, having a good relationship with their consultants is really important. That you usually reach out to the same architects, uh, to the same general contractors that you had a good experience with because they provided the project on time. So having to go to somebody that you don't know may be uncomfortable. Again, because you, these consultants are limited, they know that not everybody can do it, they may be more expensive. So that's also a challenge. Um, there, I was able to uh, also identify that there may be potential complications with tenants. Why? Because not everybody wants to go a healthy lifestyle. It's not something that everybody wants to do. So people may think, okay, that's not for me. That's uh, that's too difficult. Or okay, I want to take the elevator. I don't like the, the stick. Uh, also, we have to think about physical limitations. Not everybody can take the stairs. Not everybody's going to appreciate amenities that makes you want to walk or that makes you want to exercise. Um, th those are things that developers need to keep in mind when they're developing these buildings. And then finally, lack of awareness, because not everybody knows what a healthy building is. It may be difficult uh, for developers to bring in people that will understand and that will appreciate what these buildings are and what they can benefit from if they live or they occupy the building. So this may mean that the developer needs to educate the markets that they go into and that they, that, that means that translates into marketing dollars. So those are the challenges that I think are the most important ones. And um, I mean, as more of these buildings get built, more information will be available people will become interested or at least understand what these buildings are and how they can benefit from them. So it will become easier, but it won't happen from one day to the other. It's going to take a little bit of time so that the concept is kind of embraced and is understood the right way. So after doing that, I thought to myself, okay, is this a, a, good, a good investment? Is this something that if I'm an investor, if I'm a developer, makes sense for me as an investment, not only as a good thing, because there's a lot of benefits for occupants, but as, a, as an developer, can I benefit from? So to answer that question, uh, I first went out and, I mean, I asked myself, is there a market for this? Is, I mean, that's a very valid question to start from. Uh, so I went out, I read a lot of reports, a lot of the statistics, and then uh, I found a couple of them that I really liked. And one was from the Global Wellness Institute, and it says that by the end of 2017, the market in the United States for this building was a $134 billion market. In fact, there is, uh, there is about, I mean, there were about 750 buildings by 2017 around the world, and 350 plus were built in the United States alone. So that was the biggest market around the world for this type of build, this build. Then, uh, go ahead. Do you know where in the United States? Was it like certain cities that are known for like wanting that, like, that type uh, of lifestyle? New York, Texas, uh, Maryland, they're all over in California. Oh. They're, they're, they're in most states, but I, I don't have a list like right now, <laughs> so yeah, that no, I can I'll tell you exactly where. Curious, yeah. Yes. Um, so then the next report that I read that I really liked was from the NMHC, 
and they mentioned that by the end of 2018, 78% of renters were looking to live a healthier lifestyle. So they, they want to live in buildings that will help them get to that state. They want to occupy in buildings that help them reach that life. So it seems there is demand and there is a big market. And then there was a study done uh, on the US market as a whole that stated that the demand for healthy buildings is way higher than expected and that there is a lot of undersupply in most of the markets around the United States. So in most states, the, there is demand that developers don't know about, and there's not supply for it. Okay, I have a two-fold question. One, uh, the cost to build a healthy building, is that greater? I mean, does that push a healthy building into a certain market? So is this going to be like a luxury type, no. or can it be built on a, a basis it, it where... It can be built both uh, as a luxury option, but it can also be built as a regular market building, and it can also be built affordable. as affordable. Yes, there is a program by Fannie Mae that supports developers who want to do this concept. So the answer to your question is it doesn't necessarily have to be luxury. There are a lot of luxury uh, buildings that have, a, residential buildings that have adopted some of these things, but it doesn't necessarily mean it has to be lost. Okay, so after doing that uh, research, then that answered my first part of the question, there is a market for healthy buildings. So I, my next question was, is there an additional cost to building this? Because we're adding a lot of features. We're adding a lot of things, not only in design, but we're also using some materials that are different. So I went out, I did some research, and I started with finding how much a certification costs. Mm -hmm. So Fidwell is less expensive than well. And well usually um, recertifies buildings based on how big they are, and if they are residential or an office building, but those are the average prices too. Certified. And then FIDO has more of like a big structure as far as certification. Um, then uh, I read about other developers that have uh, adopted this and a lot of these studies. And the consensus is that there is an increase, of course, in the cost, but it's depending on the market. It, de it depends on what you want to build, how much you want to put in. And that the increase is not as high as people would expect. In fact, most developers uh, had mentioned, and the consensus was that it's a minimal increase, and some of them are able to build for uh, as little as less than 1% increase, mm -hmm. depending on how they design, and depending on what they do, and depending on what they offer. And also depends on the type of building, of course, residential or office but they have been able to build for a, for a minimum increase of 1%. What would the high side be? It depends on the market. CBRE um, actually uh, built uh, two office buildings in Canada, and one was built in Vancouver, and they're very similar. The one in Vancouver was built by a 5% uh, increase, and the one in Toronto was built by a 15% increase. So it all depends on the market. I mean, we all know this. That it doesn't cost the same to build in Florida than it is in New York or California. It, it, it varies. So depending on what you do, um, I mean, like I said, a lot of them have been able to build for a 1% increase only. So it depends on what you want to do. It depends on you want to, whether you want to certify or if you only want to incorporate some of these features without going for certification. Most of them believe that the certification cost is it's minimal. It's not such a big thing, or it's not as big as they as people would expect it would be. Uh, as far as the dollar amount, it's again it's difficult to determine a specific number. But uh, some of them had say that um, they can bill for uh, two dollars and twenty per square feet additional. Some of them have been able to do something a little bit more expensive, so they go uh, um, up to four dollars per square feet of additional cost, but um, again, the consensus was that it's minimal. 
that answered my question that there is additional cost. And then uh, I asked myself, okay, there's additional cost. Is there a benefit that can offset all, uh, all these additional costs? And the answer was yes. Why? Most developers that have adopted this concept, both on residential and office building, have been able to achieve higher than the market rental rates, higher than their own performance rental rates, faster absor absorption, the lease up periods have been so fast, um, vacancy is uh, less in these buildings. In the case specifically of office, employees have seen higher productivity. They have been able to experience less salary expenses because people want to stay. So they don't leave, they don't have to train new uh, employees that come in. Uh, they attract uh, higher um, level employees, better talent. So overall, they have been able to, to experience positive outcomes. They, I mean, that was a consensus. I read a lot of case studies. I read a lot about what developers have experienced. And this is, I mean, th there's a lot of positive outcomes. And then something that is very interesting that I read, um, because of the features that these buildings have, they have been able to achieve lower operating expenses. One example, electricity bills. People use the stairs more than the elevator, so it goes down. The temperature control that they have in the rooms allows them to reduce electricity bill. Maintenance goes down. So because, I mean, if you think about it, they are able to reach higher rents. So that means higher income, less operating expenses, better bottom line. And I mean, I think most of you have already taken the financial class, and we know that can translate in a higher value for the building. So those are the things that all these developers that have pioneered this concept have been able to achieve. So there is a benefit that can offset all of these additional costs. And most of them have mentioned that um, it's way worth the investment. So before we jump into Broward County, I wanted to show you some uh, images so you can compare between a healthy building and a conventional building. And you can see how all these features are put together. I don't have all of the features, but I'll have so you can see. So regular, conventional office building. There's light coming in. Uh, it's white, but it looks like it's probably in the back of a building. Probably you have to take a door to actually see it. Um, versus this one. Here's the entrance. That's the first thing that you see. The elevators are probably here. So uh, it looks open. There's a lot of daylight coming in. They, they are attractive. So I mean, big difference between one and the other. A building lobby mm -hmm. right here. It's modern. It's very nice. Here's the, here's the entrance from the street, and probably the main entrance is right here because here's the, the reception area. But where are the stairs? You go straight to the <coughs> elevator. Office, uh, office building that was built really healthy. Here's the entrance. First thing that you see, the staircase. Here's the, here's the cafeteria. Uh, look at how they designed the stairs so that it's attractive. That's the first thing that you see. So it's, it's kind of shocking if you walk into the building and you see it. It makes you want, it, it will probably make you want to take it because you probably won't see the elevator right away. So you will probably think, okay, this is my option. Remember, to give you an insert, a more comical insert. Remember we had a question set where you had to make a, ju a judgment on an answers for landscaping and how landscaping would be decided. I had one student stating she got lost multiple times and trapped in a nice store because she followed uh, the landscaping and the architecture. So when I look at this demonstration now for entrance uh, orientation, um, you get Trapped in quotation marks with that stair. You, you're like, I want to go there. What's this? Exactly. And then boom, you're exactly. two floors up. Yeah. 
As a designer, that's one of the key things that we covered in design school was, again, fit well, and how can we design spaces to make people healthier? And to make the stairs attractive and front and center, like you said, is exactly the point. Because the more and more you get employees walking, the healthier they are, and the less they have to spend on also health insurance. Exactly, health insurance. Conference room, right here. It's enclosed. There is some green right here. We don't know if it's um, plastic or if it's real. Some uh, art on the walls. Here's the lighting. That I mean, that's it. It's very enclosed. No windows. No no views. This is a healthy building. You have a window. You can see the probably the streets. Some buildings. There's green right here on the outside. The high ceiling makes. The room looks bigger. There's a wall right here. It's glass, so you can see the outside. There's action going outside, so you're in a meeting, but you have people walking by. It, it looks brighter. It looks open. <coughs> Some rooftops. Ones in the bottom are conventional buildings. They're nice. I mean, the views are really nice. <laughs> We're not going to lie about that. Um, areas where socialize, they can have some fun, relax, uh, healthy buildings. If you let, take a look at right here, there's a walking trail in the middle of all that green. So imagine you're in your residential building and you want to go for a run, you can just go upstairs to the roof, have a quick run, and you will feel like you're in the middle of nature anyway. You can also have views to Take a look right here, you can probably see other buildings around. Right here, social areas, um, there's a lot of green around. Green on top of this curve right here that provides the right shadow. Here, as you can see, it's open. There are no shadows. Remember what I mentioned? It's important to provide a lot of daylight, but it's also important to have shadows for mental health and for physical health. <coughs> So, why would I pick a healthy building? Uh, other than the fact that there's a lot of benefits for occupants. As a developer, I have already explained to you, there are benefits for you as well. You have a product that is different, so that gives you market differentiation. If you are pioneering the, uh, the concept, there's nothing around it that it's gonna uh, be a direct comparable. There, there may be competition, but there's nothing like your concept. It's something different. You're benefiting the communities. You can get a good reputation from being a developer that thinks about uh, the benefits of occupants, whereas only thinking about profiting. So um, I believe those are good causes for, for you to pay healthy buildings versus a conventional building. Again, going back to what I said about the cost, it's dependent, but you can make it work. Um, now that I bring up the cost, um, there is there was one case study that I read. Um, Amway Residential wanted to build a green and healthy certified building in Chicago, and it's called 900 Plus. Uh, they were not able to make the cost effective. They, the building was a lot. I mean, it was really expensive to build. They were introducing two certifications, so that, that made it more expensive. And, uh, but they really wanted to commit to the health features. So what they did, they went out, started looking for alternatives. They ended up building with modular construction. So they were able to reduce the cost tremendously. And then they were able to introduce the healthy concept into their building they have successfully listed up. Finally, <laughs> go ahead. Um, besides the, the cost, or the, the better marketability of the product with these features, is there any immediate savings in the form of, uh, besides the OPEX, is it, so seeking, applying these features without getting the certification, that, that, that would simply be a marketing well, if you think about it, if you don't certify, but let's say that you use a system that will control your temperature, you have, let's say, an office building, right? And you're controlling the temperature. 
you're also uh, lowering your expenses anyway, right? So there's a chance for you to also benefit even if you don't certify. But the certification <laughs> was with the second system, Fitwell. That's, that's, yeah, about that's ten thousand dollars once only. Yes, correct. So, um, I compare this certification to LEED. There was a time when LEED came up on the market and the buildings have been LEED certified to make a statement and a nice golden plate uh, back on the uh, side, the building is LEED certified, an explanation for that's just LEED. So until I think a standard like this or a uh, direction like this is established, I don't need to tell you guys what LEED is. You have been exposed to that in the classes or in your work life. Yeah? So it's kind of turning into common sense, general knowledge. Um, until then, I think if you want to make a point, and I don't want to reach out for Broward County, but she said at national level there are only very few buildings built like this already. I bet they're all certified to have that extra branding stamp on it to make an extra dot to the eye. Yeah. So in 10 years, oh yeah, we built our buildings with LEED and with Fitbook. No questions asked. But until then, I think the certification in that direction is a must. Particularly for your branding. Let's say if you want to build something like this in not directly downtown for Nauradil, but close by. You want to make that differentiation. I mean, especially if you want to get, like the professor mentioned, the market differentiation, you've got to certify to be able to say, oh, I'm healthy deal. And it's 10, 10 grand on a budget of multiple millions. So, right. so, yeah, so, so the recertification means that every so often, the, the, the recertification body has to come back and, and they take a look and make sure that you're maintaining the correct. status of uh, That's healthy correct. stuff. That's correct. Okay. They, they come and they, let's say that you have this uh, water quality feature. They come and test your water. They test the temperature in your room. They, can, they test, I mean, they look at the materials that you have used. They make Air sure quality. that you have maintained the quality of the building and that you're still under the standards. Okay. So one follow-up question. Okay. Step on already embracing the. Uh Not yet. I'm gonna try to. All right. Yeah. We have some buildings because it, 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 you have to look at the at the right market. You gotta find places where where the concept is gonna be embraced, and it's not gonna be that challenging for you, right? If you wanna try to look for, I mean, you can pioneer it everywhere, but um, it will be easier to find markets where you have um, demographics that can support. You. So I have some projects in mind that I can try to persuade my boss <laughs> to introduce some of this. I have a question. Yes. How do you know which one's better for you, between fit well or well? Oh, that's a tough question. I don't know if better is the right word. They have different. It's, it's different. They, they, they are scoring the same features, but they do it different. So maybe if you want to have, I don't know how to answer your question. It's, it's like ATT and Verizon. Yeah. No, there no, must be a list of features. Like there is, there there is like, which one you go for? Like, you have to There go. is no better or worse. It's, there is a lot of consensus that fit well is easier to achieve, but there are more categories that you have to fit into. Then there is a lot of detail and well. So maybe, maybe well will become a little bit more expensive for you to build because there is a lot of detail that they score. I mean, if you want to have one of the highest levels of certification, it may be more expensive and maybe fit club will be a little bit better for you, but there is no better or worse. It's just different ways of seeing something. But at the end, for uh, someone who wants to rent, let's say you want to rent an office mm -hmm. from a building that has one or the other, you just See well, and you say, That's well, good. They, they or you would go for the other one because it might have something that they they don't have something different. It's just different ways of categorizing all these features. It doesn't necessarily mean that it because it's fit well. Oh, it's, it's easy, so uh, it's less. No, it's just it's That's just comparable. Terrible. Yeah, exactly. It's like going to to going to university and getting the same degree. There's no better or worse. So, so in that instance. 
whichever one gives you the marketing ability and is more cost effective, right? Mm -hmm. I will say so, yeah. yeah. Yes. But both are well known. Yeah. And there are a lot of companies that have become ambassadors of these certifications. Like I know one of the GCs that have really stepped up their game and they, they have tried to promote these concepts is uh, Clark. Clark has been has become an ambassador and they have been trying to make people aware that this is a good concept. And they have, I mean, they are on their feet well. They, they are feet well ambassadors. Uh, all developers have become ambassadors as well. Tower companies is an ambassador. Uh, Dell's, so I don't know. <laughs> I don't know if there is a better or worse. I don't think there's a better or worse. I think it's just different ways of approaching it. And who, who gives credit to them? Like who says, like, of course they, they, they have a list of features and they say, well, this is good, this makes this building good yeah. for health or, exactly. you know, like, like the, who has given them the credit of saying this, you know, what I do is right, like, you know well, what I mean? They, they, they were established and they did a lot of research before they can put together these scoring cards and they did that based on uh, what planners have also mentioned, so th there is a background, it's not like I came up with and saying, oh, I'm going to score this and this is going to be good for your health. It was evidence-based, there was a lot of research, people from Harvard had, had helped then develop all these uh, categories where they can score. Right? So it's, it's not that it was just invented. There's background and there has been research, a lot of planning. Like I mentioned, I mean, planners have been talking about incorporating all these things since the early 1900s, so it, it's, it's, there's a history behind it. That's a, good, that's a good question. I, I wonder why the U.S. GBC didn't uh, so, didn't see this as an opportunity and just went whoosh, double up the. Uh, I think I think they were <coughs> they were part of creating web. Okay, so there's probably people in there that were involved in the. the, the yeah, there, there is a lot of uh, entities that have helped put all of these standards together. I know that U.S. CBG uh, they have helped with web, and then the U.S. Center for Disease Control basically. Created feedback. <laughs> I, I gotta know more about the plant wall. Uh, <laughs> is is there? I have never built a plant yeah, wall. Yeah, but, but do they? Do you, do you know if they use soil, or is it purely like? Uh, I will talk to you about this. Later. <laughs> I have some insights. Okay, hydroponic <laughs> soil. Most people. Yeah. 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 for another day. Let's have to finish our presentation and then we switch to Daniel. Yeah. Okay. Um, do various states or municipalities actually give any type of credit besides the Fannie Mae um, option for healthy buildings? Do, do you know of any state that they actually give a developer? You're building a healthy building, you're going to get it certified, we're going to give you some type of incentive. I didn't read about any specific incentives from municipalities. Uh, I know that they support this, but I, um, I mean, probably will help you get through the planning portion of, of your project, but I haven't read about any specific um, monetary or tax benefit from from municipalities towards this field. Well, this might be actually the the angle or or leverage point where this might come actually to be valuable for the communication between developers and um, communities. And uh, the vice president of facilities <laughs> management on this campus <laughs> is raising his hand, so he has some insights too. Yeah. So. Daniel Alfonso, I'm the VP of Facilities uh, Public Safety here at the University, but before this, my prior life, I was the city manager for the city of Miami. The city of Miami current building code requires that you include a lot of lead of components into your building, so you won't even get a permit for your building if you don't include certain components. So the whole issue of lead and these type of, of uh, improvements to a building are getting into the planning and building codes of a lot of these companies. In many cases now, you won't even be able to get a permit for a building if you include like recycling and those type of things. So, so having uh, people in the city side support these developments, would that kind of show 
higher success rate of approvals or maybe an expedited approval process or were you able to find any evidence? Well, you will have to uh, go by the book anyway. Um, not mm -hmm. because you have healthy right. features, uh, you're going to present something that doesn't meet the requirements. So it's like, I mean, this this is like any type, other type of building that you want to um, go ahead and build. You have to go through the entire process the same way. So you have to um, meet whatever the code is telling you to do and like I mentioned, uh, go by the book. So it, it's not like this is gonna have a different standards or different building code. It's You're gonna go by the conventional building code for any type of building. So you, you gotta meet all the standards anyway. So it's a cherry on top. Hmm? The cherry on top. <laughs> yeah, I, I, I'm sorry, I'm gonna give you one, one very particular example. If you design a building you, you know, what's a component to buildings downtown that's very expensive? It's your parking, right? Think about it. You can reduce the number of parking spaces by putting in features that allow people to commute in. So more bicycle racks, uh, more po closer building to uh, public transportation. Those type of things will give you credits so you can build less parking space into your building. So if you think about that, that's, uh, that's in the code. And those are also things that, that these healthy buildings adopt. They want to make buildings walkable. So if you're closer to a, let's say to a public transportation station, then you might be able to get some benefits. So that's the way that you benefit, not like dollar specific or something like it. And that also, as you pointed out, depends on the regional context. Uh, one of the last <laughs> planning and zoning meetings I had in my prior life in Idaho, was attending a, a presentation of a apartment building complex and they pretty much said they were going to reduce the parking spots with bicycle spots. They literally counted two bicycles per apartment unit and they provided parking spots in a separate shed, lockable locker, bike locker, or bike barn, that's a local term, uh, for that. Noting that the local university has bike barns in the parking garages all over the place and is providing showers for uh, employees if they chose to commute in and out on the bike. Like I commuted for five years pretty much every day on my bike to work. Here I drive 15 minutes. So we'll figure it out. Finish up. Okay. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. So the last part of my research for my project was to try to figure out and answer the question, can this work in Broward County? So to do that, I had to, um, well, I started by reading uh, what healthy buildings have been built in Florida to kind of see if this is something that has been done in something in sort of like a similar market. Um, <coughs> there are not many. Um, actually, probably the closest one that has been certified, it's up in Orlando, and there's another one in Lake Nona. Those are both office buildings. They are well certified, uh, but those will be the closest one. There is nothing down here in Miami-Dade or Palm Beach, uh, and not something in Broward, that has been certified um, fit well or well. Um, <coughs> there are some buildings, um, there's one in Miami Day, it is not certified, but they have been advertising that they uh, wanted to incorporate uh, all these healthy features, and it's called Aventura Park. So they have been advertising that uh, they were built under healthy standards, but um, there's no certification out there. As, as, I mean, as far as what I read, no certification yet. And there are some uh, luxury condos in Palm Beach that what they have done uh, is try to uh, promote people to be healthier. Uh, some of them have <coughs> included uh, this service in which they give their occupants uh, an app so they can find areas around the building where they can get healthy food options and the app allows you to an order, uh, bring a delivery to your home. But as far as getting a building certified, I couldn't find anything in Broward or in the proximity. Like I said, the closest ones are out there in uh, Orlando. There is a community in Tampa 
it's actually a healthy community and it's been built out in phases they started in 2016 I can't remember the name of it uh, but um, <coughs> that's the closest a healthy certified buildings or community that I was able to find. So with Broward, I started, um, I figured, okay, I'm gonna try to find it if there is some potential market for, for this type of building. So Broward County has a population of around 1.9 million people. Um, the largest age groups that I, that I found were out of between 45 to 50. Then um, following up young adults between 25 and 34 and other adults between 55 to 64. The reason I bring this up is if you think about it, uh, and if you want to try to answer the question, who will be a potential occupant for these buildings? In the case of offices, uh, you want uh, employers or companies that, that they would like to attract young talent Thanking people, um, somebody that can bring fresh ideas into your business, but you also want the right amount of executives that can bring the, their experience. So you want some, uh, you want a little bit of both, and that falls into different age groups. If you think about residential, it's the same thing. If you want to build a residential healthy building, you want to bring in tenants uh, from different age groups probably you want some millennials, some generation Xers, uh, people that want to live a healthier lifestyle and that they are aware of all the benefits that, or if they are not aware that you can educate them and they will appreciate all the benefits that you can get from these buildings. So you get different age groups. And if you see uh, those are, uh, <coughs> if you add all the percentages, you get a big group in Broward County that may be potential occupants for um, both a residential or an office building, if you want to say it like that. Um, then I went on and tried to look for patterns or behavior from all these residents in Broward. 66% are currently exercises on a regular basis. Um, the bigger um, percentage of in between that group uh, exercises at least three times a week. Some of them exercise five times a week, and the smaller percentage exercises only once a week. So there's a lot of movement. They are, they are aware they need to exercise to improve their health. And surprisingly, 29.1% of this group exercises at home. So in case you're a developer and you want to do a residential healthy building, uh, those are potential tenants they are gonna appreciate having all these amenities that, that will boost their physical activity. So, I mean, th that's a potential market right there. Then 36.5% uh, of residents are already controlling their eating habits. So you see, I mean, there is potential. Broward has uh, residents that are already looking into their health. They wanna live a healthier lifestyle. So there is potential there, and there is potential market right here, if you think about it, for both type of buildings. Um, then after answering that, that question for myself, that there is uh, a potential um, occupant for this building, I went ahead and tried to uh, explore on the financials. Uh, it's, it was hard, and uh, it's hard to come up with a, a number or a cost, it's, it depends on what you want to build, it depends on um, where you want to build it. Uh, so it's very difficult that all these developers that have um, built healthy buildings in other markets, they have been successful. All the case studies um, show a consensus of positive outcomes, positive returns, higher um, values when they sell these buildings. And even if they keep them for the long run, they have seen um, positive outcomes and they have been able to benefit from this. So I ask myself the question, if it works in other uh, areas, in other locations in the United States, why wouldn't it work in Broward? If we see that the population is already leaning towards living a healthier lifestyle, why wouldn't it work? 
I mean, I think it's a matter of finding somebody that is willing to take the risk, is willing to do the research, is willing to put in the time to figure out, can this work for me? And uh, just like Amblin, like I mentioned earlier, they found an alternative to make the cost work. I mean, there, there may be a chance for a developer to come in, do the same, do the research, get the numbers, run some performance, make the underwriting work, so that they make their returns attractive, they, men, they make the rental levels attractive, and they are able to draw from this group of people that, um, that are potential tenants for those buildings. So, um, just so that I don't make this very long, <laughs> I think, I mean, we are the new professionals in this industry. Uh, we gotta be open to new ideas, new concepts. We gotta embrace the fact that um, we, we shouldn't be just thinking about profit. We need to think about bringing good things for the communities that we wanna build. In. We wanna think about um, future generations. What are we leaving our kids, our grandkids? I mean, we gotta be able, like I work for a developer, I gotta be able to talk to my boss who may be old school and would not want to uh, do something like this and uh, persuade him and make him see, okay, this is something good. It's not only good for the people that you're building for, you're gonna benefit from it. Uh, let's take some time, do some research, try to um, put, it, put this concept into the words and see if, if, if it's a successful story like all the other successful stories that are out there because there are a lot of reports. A lot, uh, the ULI has a lot of very interesting reports that I can share with you if you talk to me privately it, that show a lot of these buildings, uh, redevelopment, new buildings. Um, there was a redevelopment in North Carolina very old building. Uh, it was 30% occupied. It was. It's a. I think it was like 108 percent something. It's a big building. It was like I said, 30% occupied. They redeveloped. They did a healthy office uh, space, and it is currently 90% occupied. And it has been since they did this back in 2011. So, like I said, we need to think about how we're going to benefit the communities that we want to work in. We are the new generation in this industry, and we got to embrace concepts like this that not only help us as a developer, but that will help people that are going to occupy this field. And just so you can see, that's a rendering from a uh, healthy building in New York City. And I want to thank you all for your time, and I hope that I answer all your questions and that you enjoy this, and that you go out and <laughs> talk to people about healthy buildings and how they can benefit you as a developer or as an investor and the community. Thank you. All right, this was amazing, if I can say so. Um, you also realize, as a learning experience, Marcella, um, this is different than the five to 10 minutes you give in a team presentation. This is different than the 10, 15 minutes you give as a solo presentation in other classes. So this was a solid 45 minute plus plus, so about an hour with I'm questions. Um, and it's a, it's a different pace. So you have to remember that when you talk uh, in front of the and Sony Commission, in front of uh, uh, the bankers, in front of a class like this, these are different audiences and you have different paces. How you can stress this out, how you use your words, how you use, use your uh, visuals. I would like to use that. I don't understand. I'm polite to introduce people who are quite silly. I didn't pick that up from you, young man over there, but still, <laughs> did not pick that up. Um, again, I would like to thank you, uh, Marcella for her hard work presented here today. Um, I guesstimate that she is done with the final conclusions next week. We're going to run this actually through a copy edit. I would like to actually pass that on to the regional ULI uh, uh, think tanks. Um, I told you we're going to make you a bit world famous for this. <laughs> um, and this is an example to give credit where credit is due, and don't be shy about great work. Um, the style, the visualization, and the talk she gave, quiet but solid. 
Um, this is what I consider a almost, if not a perfect presentation in a format of 45 minutes. So keep that in mind for those who haven't had me yet in a presentation style class. There are different ways to present data, different ways to tell the story. It's all about telling the story. And I think she did an excellent, magnificent job in this. Um, speaking of magnificent jobs, I would like to introduce in a very informal way, because I posted the whole bio press release about him, uh, Daniel, da Daniel J. Alfonso. He is the VP for Facilities and Public Safety here at Nova Southeastern. Um, he came to us in December 2017. Was prior uh, before Nova, he was at uh, the um, city manager of the city of Miami. Turned Miami around. Was it a double B to triple A? Double A. Huh? Double A. Double A. Triple B. Triple B to double A. In, in, in ratings. So there's immense impact on the financials uh, on, the, on the city to see. And he spent about 17 years in county so, government. So. That was MDC abroad, Miami um, Day. I'm delighted to have him here. He gives us a different insight on facilities and development. Uh, last year he came in with a case study and asked students, hey, where would you place the next building on campus with the following uh, regulations? Today the idea is he gives us a 30,000 uh, feet flyover on his work, what he's doing, what is the daily business of a position like this? Um, but we also um, ask him to get us back to the towers, to the dorms, because he's pretty much like a real estate developer with this. He's tasked to deal with this construction. He's also tasked with the hospital and other buildings. So our idea was to have an open conversation about this work, to give you some more insights. And remember, there are different flavors in real estate development. I think. He is the closest we get into the classroom with this session, uh, this uh, class, that we could consider corporate uh, real estate. All right? If you see the university has one big corporation, he is the guy who runs pretty much corporate real estate for us. Right? Um, and around 10, we said, 10 ish, uh, we will actually take a, a, a site visit. Do you think we can actually walk through the student union building and access the site by foot, like walking around there, or should we take the cars and park it off? I'm pretty sure we can walk over. Yeah, we might be fit, right? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so that, that gives us about that gives us about two hours from here to there and back. That should be plenty of time, plus a lunch break. So that's perfect. Um, there you go. It's all yours. All right. Well, good morning. Thank you for uh, having me here. How many of you took the tour the first time? Went to the to the uh, rest hall. I mean, it was it was in baby steps. That uh, this building has been going gangbusters uh, right now. The structure itself is completely done, and they're doing all interior work at this time. Part of the building, uh, the north wing of it, is actually completed. So we'll be able to see some units that are pretty much done. The only thing is we move furniture in because by August 9th there are students going to be moving in there. So it's been, uh, it's been quite a project. Um, the contractor has been, has been doing a fantastic job, so I don't know if this is wood, but I find some wood on it. The underside might be a little bit. Oh, uh, yeah? <laughs> um, and you know, it's funny, uh, watching uh, the young lady's presentation, uh, I got to relive some of the discussions that took place. You know, when we're doing this building, there's, there's a lot of folks that are looking at different priorities for the building. We want to maximize the number of beds in the building, right? And you look at some of the design concepts that people are thinking about in terms of being um, more open and whatnot. I mean, if you look at the stodgy old style lobby where you walk in and you got the elevators, you know, low roof or low ceiling, there's something right above that that's usable square footage. The other lobby looked beautiful, right? It was wide open. But think about all that space that some other person is looking at and think, man, if I put floors in there, you know how many more additional office square feet? How many more square feet I can put in there? Right? So there's always that, that challenge and that balance. Well, if you have this beautiful lobby, how much more can I charge per square foot in this building versus the building that is a regular standard old construction? So ultimately, you're going to have to make up the, the, the difference in, in revenue to the bottom line in the, next, in the higher rent. You know, so is my building with these concepts worth the higher rent? Are people willing to pay that higher rent? 
And that's a challenge that, that you're going to have. Here at the university, when we started doing the residence hall, it was supposed to be a, a P3 project, public-private partnership. We actually started construction before having the entire deal inked. So we were very impressed with the developer that he was willing to go out there on a limb because he was about $5 million into uh, work in terms of design. Yeah, <laughs> design, he started actually clearing the site, foundation started going in, and we hadn't yet finished all the development agreement because we had to have it by August of this year. Uh, at the very last minute, the financing for the three people in P3 did not go through and the university ended up doing its own financing. So he was sweating. Uh, Rise is the developer and Juno is the contractor. Okay. So, uh, did you issue bonds for that? Yes, we ended up issuing a bond, $76 million. So since the original project was supposed to be a P3, they were also looking at LEED certification. And uh, in terms of cost cutting, you know, this came right down to the wire at the end. So they're putting in, you know, somebody asked, can you put in the, the concepts of it but not pay for the certification? And in the end, this is what they ended up doing. They're basically putting in the components of LEED certification, but they're not paying for the plaque. Because paying for the plaque meant another half a million dollars to the project. And you're thinking, well, Half a million on 76 million is really less than 1%, right? I mean, or thereabouts. <laughs> but ultimately, they say, you know what? Uh, we're, we're further along. We don't have a management agreement or development agreement yet. We can't commit to that. So the building is being built with lead certification components, but it's not getting the plaque, unfortunately. Um, can I get it later? Yes, you can. You can go back and get a certification. After the fact. <laughs> so that was one one uh, things. When, when you look at the building today, you'll see a lot of the components of the open spaces, where the student study rooms are, you know, the materials that are being used, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Um, we do live in Broward County, and people do love their cars, so we are building a huge parking garage for students on campus. <laughs> we try we try to do bicycle racks, but just they don't get used as much <laughs> for some reason. Um, the hospital is the other big development that we got going on campus. I don't know if you've seen the University on the 30th. There's now four cranes up in there. It's got their construction at the same time. Interesting uh, side, sidebar on that. The Bank of America building in the corner is a lease. HCA came in and completely purchased the property. And now you, I can see it up there. This is the old, the old map. Still the old map. Yep. <laughs> Google has not updated. Over here, this, this, no, no, over here. Wait, there, that's it. I'm right. here. Yeah. That used to be the University Park Plaza. There's the Bank of America right there. Uh, Bank of America bought from, from where the little University Park Plaza luggage sign is. That entire parcel right there is 11 acres. They paid a nice sum of $30 million for the 11 acres. Bank of America for it? No, I'm sorry. HCA. Okay. Pay thirty million dollars for the property to build their facility. They bought it with the tenant, Bank of America, and Bank of America has the remaining eighteen years on their lease. <laughs> yeah. How many of you know uh, the right to quiet enjoyment rules? Yeah. <laughs> when you when you rent a property, you have a right to quiet enjoyment, right? So your landlord cannot interfere with your operation of the facility, and. Uh, do you think that construction site is interfering with the business <laughs> operation of Bank of America on the corner? To, to, give, you, to give you a quick uh, answer, that is the same law, same legal ruling. Remember that Harley Day, uh, the motorcycle shop yeah. uh, and the Home Depot deal with the Rotella Group we had la uh, last session or last Saturday? Um, that is pretty much the same concept. You lease, you have the right to stay. So uh, there's a, a little interesting fight going on right now. Because the footprint for Bank of America in, in their lease includes some of the property where ACA is putting their footings in the building. Mm -hmm. So they have a conversation that's going on. And since ACA bought the entire property, they're coming to us and asking, hey, can you help us with Bank of America? And I'm like, hey, I'm, I'm out of the picture. I sold you the land, now you got to deal with your tenant. <laughs> so it's, a, it's an interesting dynamic. 
And these are two very large corporations. You know, Bank of America, although that's a little branch, Bank of America is a, is a huge organization, and so it's HCA. So they're, they're kind of going back and forth, and we're talking. We are trying to help out. We're trying to look for a possible uh, off-site for the bank to move their operation to on a temporary basis, and then they're trying to work out a deal. Well, well, if you build a new building, we'll give you X number of square feet, and then you can come occupy a brand new shiny penny bank. You know, but Bank of America seems to have this philosophy that they like standalone buildings on corners. Yeah. So we're having a, a whole discussion about that. I got a corner on the other side, but we're not willing to give it up. So, you know, on the south side of 36, right? They're asking us, hey, can we get that corner? So, oh, no, 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 no. I got my own development plans for that. <laughs> so how do you want to put on that? Uh, well, that right now. Are you allowed to say that? Yes, yes, because that's this is public record in the city of Davie. You can go and look. Where that used to be a car dealership. I don't know how many of you lived in this area long enough to know. That used to be a car dealership. I think it was Buick, uh, if I understand. We, the university, purchased that property and is inside of something called the CDD, the Community Development District. Okay. So the the rights to that property in terms of development that are already established by the master plan, etc., are for a hotel and uh, office space to go into that space. Mm -hmm. That is what is uh, as of right. In, in the plans. So since the university, if you scroll up please, since the university is also looking at the north side of what used to be the University Park Plaza, uh, you see where the lake is at. The president of the university has expressed many, many times that on that north end of the parcel, he wants to do a hotel as well. So we have two sites where we can do hotels. Uh, there are a couple of large national firms that have a purchase and they might be interested in doing two where they do a flagship by the lake and then they do one of their lower flags down at the parcel. Both would serve the hospital, both could serve the university, both could serve the, the growing <coughs> development that is going on in Davie. I mean, Davie doesn't have a whole lot of hotel. You know? I mean, that, that thing's are holy day in over on Davie. Um, They're the renewing the residence and plantation on 84. Oh, okay, okay. So, so this is uh, something that is currently obviously being looked at. The north side of the University Park Plaza, that, that entire parcel from the west side regional medical center to the north. We're currently working with a de uh, developer and plan plotting out what the different uses could be. We're moving the canal. This is already approved. So right here we see the canal goes straight up. And there's that parcel of, road, of property right there. We're moving the canal over and that bump is going to become part of the University Park Plaza development. So the question that we're having right now and the discussions that we're having is, how do we develop that? Because by the way, we're 50% owners of that. We don't own that 100%. We, we're equal partners with the owners of what used to be University Park Plaza. Do we develop it to the point where we get plans and then sell those plans, right? Because you can, you can get that development to a certain level and say, okay, do I have an investor who wants to come in and buy, here's your right to build a 700 unit residential building whether you want to do that as rental, condo, assisted living facility, whatever you like, you take it on and then we just get the cash, which is basically what we did with the hospital, right? We worked out a deal with the hospital. We said, well, you're going to have maximum flexibility. You're going to build your hospital on your terms. In our deal, we worked out uh, design criteria. We wanted the hospital to have a certain look, right? You got to put some kind of Mediterranean feel to it. You want to have uh, the roof tiles, the color schemes, those type of things. So it kind of blends in with the university, so it wouldn't be a completely different building. You would do the same thing on the development uh, to the north of that. The designs would have to be in, in marriage with the surrounding area, right? So that's part of it. When you sell it, you can put some restrictions on it. That's still the discussion that, that we're having. Um, Also, with the hospital, part of the deal was that the hospital would provide um, internship slots for our medical school. Mm -hmm. So that was that was part of the transaction as well. So yes, you bought the property, you can run the hospital as you want, but we entered into an agreement that since we now have the MD program, our medical students will have slots in your uh, hospital as priority. I have a question on the um, canal. The canal is basically there for stormwater drainage. That's correct. Okay, and that's the thing to okay. Yeah, you have to keep the canal. You can't just cover it. Um, so the canal, it will stay. Uh, that is actually South uh, Broward. Was a, I, I keep the South Florida 
water management district. But I think Broward has some own piece. Uh, what are you doing with the uh, existing uh, medical center? Because they have now a big banner. Speaking of the disruption uh, for big construction sites, they actually have a huge uh, banner out on the tower of theirs and saying, we are open 24-7, ER is open 24-7. Because apparently they did have that experience that people would perceive the site under construction and the hospital may be closed. Right. So, so what's yes. the basic on this? So this, this is also an HCA property. That, that emergency room is an HCA property. They are keeping it open, it, uh, open and they will incorporate that. That will become the emergency entrance to the hospital. Okay. So they're incorporated into the building. That makes it easier. Right. It's the same entity. <laughs> it's the same. Right. It's the same entity. Yeah. I don't think they would have. They would have bought it if it wasn't there. Their I stepped in a minute late. Can you talk about the timeline for for the university's purchase of, of this retail center with the old CC's pizza that I missed? Okay. No. The university currently owns fifty percent of that property with HCA. No, no, with a person called Jeff Brandon. Jeff Brandon and Associates is the family that originally owned the entire shopping center. Mm -hmm. And in, I think in the late 90s, the university uh, entered into an agreement and the university bought uh, that property. And I can say this with the president of the town halls. For $5 million, they bought 50% ownership in the entire shopping center. So it was a good deal, since yeah. we now sold 11 acres of it for 30 million, mm -hmm. oh. right? Uh, and we still own the other half. I'd like to get that kind of investment. Anybody? Yeah. <laughs> Simple math, pretty much. Uh, so we own 50% of the development that will come. The current rights that remain on this property because of the uh, planning work that has been done in the city are huge. Uh, there's still like 400,000 square feet of retail that are allowed in this, in this facility. X number of hundred thousands of, uh, of uh, office space, a uh, hotel with 250 beds is allowed, uh, up to 825 residential units. I mean, this can be densified tremendously. Uh, the question, you know what the biggest limiting factor is? Parking. 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 <laughs> because think about it, if I put 825 residential units there, yeah. and then a couple hundred thousand square feet of retail space, yeah. and then a 230 bed hotel, how much parking do I need? Thousands. The estimates that we've done are nearly 3,000 parking spaces. Well, have you seen the parking lot that we're building over on the south side of the campus? It's 1,300 spaces. It would have to be twice that size. How much that cost, by the way? We actually got a pretty good deal on that one, I thought. The, the actual hard construction cost, not the soft cost, the hard construction cost was 14.8 million. Nice. Yeah. yeah. The total on end with design and the whole works, uh, it's about 17. Serious? Yeah. Remember, we're not purchasing the land. The land was already out. I understand, but it's still pretty Oh, yeah, no, it's a good deal. It's a good deal. In, in Miami, we were building for no less than like 28,000 space. We're building this for about, I want to say, 12,500, 13,000 space. Nice. Yeah, it's, it's very, very, very good. We went through a whole bid process, and we had a last and final, and we really tweaked them out. So the, the challenge now is fighting with them about the change orders. <laughs> <laughs> oh, yeah, I'm not buying that. You should have done that before. So we're we're having some uh, some discussion. There is uh, on the table right now. There's about a hundred and fifty thousand dollars in change orders that we're just doing. Where's the bill on that? Great con. So that's you know it's all part of the part of the fun I think of development. <laughs> yes. Wasn't it graduate student housing taken out? So yes, so here's what happened. We are growing our undergraduate at such a fast pace that we used to have graduate housing on the other side of the university at Rolling Hills. Mm -hmm. I don't know if you know how many of you know, but that used to be a hotel okay. at one point. The university, I'm sorry? Caddyshack. Caddyshack. Yeah, Caddyshack we own the golf course. Yeah. The hotel of Rolling Hills, right, we own the golf course. Uh, the hotel, <laughs> was right out here, she was we also own that place, that's a uh, graduate housing. And since our undergrad was growing so fast and we have a requirement that first, second year student are basically 45 credits. Under 45 credits you gotta live on campus. The graduate students were sort of uh, asked nicely to <laughs> vacate. <laughs> the 
they were not happy campers. And I, let me chime in on this because I've been a grad student in different continents in my life. Graded student housing is not provided by a university. This is an extra special universities give you to maybe have some income. Yeah? I never lived in a dorm in all my academic education. I always have been off-site, close to campus, or most walking distance to campus. So when my personal opinion on this, I have friends who have been impacted with that. They got noticed in January, February, that they have to move out by the end of May, or something in that timeline. There was a solid three or four month notice. If you look at your current rental agreement, you probably have a week, if not 30 days. So all this turmoil and, and sorry if I have to tell no, you, that. renting from the university is not cheap. No. What's the credit student housing price? What was that? I'm not sure how much that one was, but our housing ranges anywhere from like $1,200 a month to about $1,800 a month, depending on what you And you will find some little, but some gems for that price range to live on your own if you don't want to have roommates for economic purposes. So I was, when this came up on social media and folks uh, telling me, I'm like, three months notice. You're not here in summer, so you find something for September. Huh? So. Give you an example. I mean, the new residence hall—it's they're nice. They're nice. I mean, they got washer and dryers in the in the unit, dishwashers. Mm -hmm. I mean, yeah. Right. yeah the, those new residence, <laughs> the new residence hall in your unit. You have a washer and dryer. What's the square footage in the room? It varies. Uh, it's up. The single the single units are upwards of 450 square feet. I mean, they're, they're not little tiny units. I mean, in, in the city of Miami, we approved by code. Uh, mini, what do they call it? Mini micro housing. Micro housing a, a minimum of 250 square foot. I mean, that's like a hotel room apartment. I mean, a hotel room, basically, right? So when we're talking 400 square feet plus, it's, it's washer and dryer. I was like, washer and dryer. You know how much maintenance that's gonna be? Because how many of you are gonna remove the lint from the dryer? Come on, let's be honest. Right? You're gonna wash the entire semester. Nobody's ever gonna worry about the lint. I, I, on that note, I never had in grad school. I never had a washer. Oh, no, sorry. A, uh, 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 no, not laundry. Um, dishwasher. 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 Yeah. That came with the first big salary check. Yes, they have dishwashers in the unit. Yes, you'll see. You'll see when we go there. It's uh, actually so, pretty nice. And then, so, so, fun, 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 fun question: Who has a dishwasher in their house? Everyone has a dishwasher. Or? I didn't even use it. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> I, got, I got a dishwasher and I'm always washing my dishes. I never need to the darn dishwasher. In college, in college, did you have a did you have a dishwasher in college? No. 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 It, did, did you have a laundry unit in your building? No. 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 Yeah, I'll say this: so our, residence, our new residence hall is not cheap. I mean, it's it's close to eighteen thousand dollars for the year, right? For the, for the two semesters, basically. For the academic year. For the academic year. That's, a price. that's for the single unit, right? So if you're in a quad, it's, it's a little cheaper. But but that's not that's cheap. I mean, and guess what? It's sold out in three days. Oh And we haven't even opened it yet. So students, I guess. Like the pictures. <laughs> <laughs> does, it go to does it go to everybody? Yeah. Could you always reserve like nice new dorms for like athletes or like certain? No, this it went to all juniors, juniors and seniors. Yeah. First come, first serve. Okay. Uh, yeah. Do you know of any like future all campus student housing? Because I know there's one that they build or a building. There's a private organization that is building a large. Uh, Student housing complex on Gri uh, Griffin and David, right there on the corner. So that's a private. That's a private developer. His uh, name is Jeremy Betzel. Yep. The president is uh, considering another residence facility since this one so uh, filled in so quickly. If you look at our short short circle, right? The old the older units that we have there, uh, FMV, F FFE, uh, Farquhar, something that one. Yeah. Uh, Right. Oh, wait, I'm on the wrong, wrong circle. Wrong circle. This is the university. Right. So look at these, this is these three units right here, and this one were built in the 70s and 80s, and they're showing their age quite a bit. 
Um, so we're thinking the next next residence facility could go in this area and we tear those old ones down. The parking garage is going here, the new residence hall is the one we're going to go here. Um, so that'll that'll be an interesting discussion because think about it. We have we're we're up to here on undergrads. <coughs> those units are very inefficient. There's only about 150 beds in those three buildings. There's going to be 609 beds in this building. So those over there are very inefficient. But still, how do I take out 150 beds and build a new facility when I'm at 110% of occupancy? Right? So that's going to be that's going to be a challenge. So <laughs> the president's uh, a little concerned about that. As a facilities manager, you're you're in charge of all the current construction yes. that the college is doing, yeah. as well as the maintenance on all of the existing buildings. Correct. The buildings. current flushing of the toilets, the mowing of the lawn. The Are you responsible for chairs as well, like sitting furniture? For? Sitting furniture. Yes. We have several complaints in this class about this chairs. <laughs> <laughs> this table is stuck? Yes. Yeah. Which one? The chairs. That's what we brought in here for? Yeah. <laughs> Show and tell? All right. As you said, the university is growing constantly. So, in the land surrounding it, like Broward, is just growing as a whole. So, how far can you, are you? Can you come over to this area right here? Like, what are your? Yep, right there. Right. So, the university president has charged me to buy up everything up to 39th Street. Oh gosh. <clears throat> and uh, you have a little point over here. Yesterday, we just closed on three and a half acres. I'm partially blind, so there. You see this large parcel right here? Yeah. Mm -hmm. We just bought that for $2 million, three and a half acres. Uh, those houses are basically teardowns. We own this corner lot. We own this property right here, which graduate students yesterday, uh, last week, they signed the lease for $2,600 to get that house with the pool. Four graduate students entered into that lease agreement. We also own this property right here. Uh, over here, we, we own that. We own this property. There's three houses already in this area right here that we already own as well. So you guys are assembling that, that whole yes. section there? Yes, the goal is to assemble that, that entire piece. Uh, this is where our MSC is. We're in negotiations with Gloria Day right now. Uh, and uh, also the Korean church. So you're, you're open to the <laughs> 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 With, with that expansion, um, so you're open about that in public and saying, okay, we want to purchase, or is that under the radar purchasing? You know, there's a, there's a couple of brokers that we're working with, and they're actively talking to every property owner there. It's not a secret anymore. You know, when, when you, the university buys this, and buys this, and buys this, and buys this, I mean, so it's quasi public knowledge. Yeah, yeah. Right. The, the, the folks there, I mean, I had this gentleman here called me. Hey, I'm, I'm thinking of selling my house. Now, he asked me for a price that I said, no, look, look what I paid for this one and what I paid for that one. I can't pay you what you're asking. So we started talking, and he said, well, I, I can wait. I said, yeah, so can I. I got an institution that's going to be here 100 years. This gentleman, his family sold the property. He never wanted to sell to us. He died 104 years old. His family sold. Fire sale. Yeah. So, <laughs> so we, we can outlast most of these people, is what I'm trying to say. So this whole section over here is all probably residential. The other section on the left is all commercial. What this, is this is residential. Yes. So the left is commercial. What's the plan with the assemblage there? What are you guys going to do with well, over the entire it, residential? Well, eventually somebody asked, what is the future of growth of the university? Well, where do I go for growth? i got to get more land. So this, we already, we're already in here, and we already own this. I think the biggest the biggest challenge here is going to be the public storage. Mm. Post office. The post office, I don't think it's going to be that big a, a challenge because is it, what's happening to the U.S. Postal Service? Yeah, yeah. Yeah. Consolidation. Yeah. It's consolidating, it's shrinking, it's disappearing. So eventually the federal GSA is going to do that. I mean, when I was in the city of Miami, I was negotiating with them to buy their postal property on the corner of Ace, 5th Street and 2nd and, uh, Avenue in downtown. They have a, an entire city block. So here, so here are two provocative questions when it comes to land acquisition. By the way, if I look, if I look here, there's a larger piece of land available, but owned by a different university. Right, that's a problem. Yes, yes. Just across the street from us north, and we are owner of this huge development potential. 
And we have seen in presentations like six weeks ago that golf courses are now open to be redesigned. So is there any discussion about no. this out? No, don't. Okay, that okay. works. Okay, okay, you see what's happening here? All right. I know. So, I said provocative. Better be open for options. I know, I know, it's Caddyshack, right? Don't ruin that. I broke it. No. The university right now currently owns that entire parcel in a partnership, not a partnership, but uh, how should I say it? The university owns 100% of it, but it's being held in a separate corporation. So it's not part of NSU actually. This plot of land, as of right, has a development capacity for an additional something like 850 to 1,000 residential units. Now, the D requirements have a lot of restrictions in terms of how much parkland you still have to maintain. The golf course does not have to remain, but over 100 acres of green space has to remain. So there's certain restrictions on how much development you can do there. Uh, there's been talk about this is the main course and this is a small um, practice area. Right? Practice area, right? So there's been talk about well, can we develop the practice area? Okay. Yeah, but it's all very future development. There's no real plan for that yet. All we're doing this is land banking right now. Politics for person. Yes, ma'am. For parking requirements. Because your university is a different. Four spaces per thousand square feet. So it's we were you know we are looking at developing 250,000 square foot health professionals division expansion building right here on the corner of the University and 30th. The Dolphins are giving up their facility, so we're going to turn mm -hmm. that into uh, NSU Health. And if you build, as I said, 250,000 square feet. Uh, on that corner parcel right there, this garage has to grow into this area. Yes, sir. Uh, talking about how the land, uh, so we talked about the history of you know being a uh, World War II airstrip uh, foreman family, and I guess given, I don't know the, the right phrasing, with the distinction it, it stays educational. Or it right, so the entire college complex that we're in, the universities across to, the, to our uh, east yeah. and north, this is, yeah, these are all de-restricted to remain in educational okay. properties. Question. I know FAU has a campus over here. Yeah. Are they doing any expansion plans do you know of? Or? I'm not familiar with their expansion plans. I know that between BCC and FAU, I mean, they build additional parking garages mm -hmm. and they're, they're making their facilities over there newer and better, but we're competing. So on the, on the University Park Plaza, you mentioned that you had a, 50% partner in it, and when you sold, right, do, did they remain, like, so you cut it in half, essentially, or a little more than half, because you still have the northern yeah, yeah. section. Are you still in 50-50 with them, or did you buy them out? No, no, we're still in 50-50 with in the north. So then, did they roll equity in with them, or did, were they sell out, too? So they sold out also. So okay. when I say we, we, the university, and our partner, the, the partnership, sold 11 acres outright to ACA, okay. received $30 million, we paid a few million dollars in debt, and then that it 50-50 the proceeds. Okay, and then on the... Um, on the north side of it, we are designing what we think is, is possible there, and we, the idea is we either put out RFPs and get people to come in, and, and then we either co-develop or sell outright, that, that hasn't been decided yet. More so on the, um, on the golf course. Uh, um, uh, you know, I know you can put, you know, what you said, 850 to 1,000 more units there. Was that, was that land donated? Is that why that no, that's restrictions in there? No, that's not a donation. That's a, that's, that was an outright purchase. I believe there was a Japanese investment company that owned it for a while. And then you guys and then university purchased. Get, well, since it's not like a donation, like, or is there a reversionary interest in it? Or why, why would you not try to defeat that 100 acre requirement? Well, that's a deed restriction. Usually, uh, defeating a deed restriction is pretty tough, but I mean, legally it can be done. I mean, any, any legal experts here? No? Okay. I mean, I'm sure that can be done somehow, but uh, usually those are pretty tough. Yeah. I have a question. Um, when you guys are building parking structures, right, are you taking into account um, the future of cars, like cars are going to be so that you can repurpose that? That was part of the discussion that we had. Uh, 
if you if you're going to do that, right? If you're going to build a garage, you have to decide the garage right up front. It makes the parking garage significantly more expensive up front because your height ceiling, your ceiling height between floors has to be significantly more than a standard parking garage. You know, your standard parking garage probably has a clearance of about what eight feet, somewhere in that range. This slab to slab is 15 feet. So when you see a parking garage is seven levels, it's really equivalent to about a four-story building. So to convert it, you have to go in and build the height of the decks so that if you want to convert that to an office or something like that in the future, you take out the ramps and then you repurpose it, right? But uh, the way this one's constructed, no, in the future, if that, they want to do something else with that parking garage, they're going to have to level it. <laughs> so since we're about to actually get to the site, could you give us a little bit more insights on the dorms? Right. To give you an idea, guys, we are right here where it says Daniels. No? What we're going to do is we're actually going to walk through straight through the student union building. I mean, zigzag through the commons. And then you're probably going to use, go from Nova Road on the construction entrance. I think that's the only entrance, isn't it? Yeah. Yeah. So we have enough time to actually have this as a not too slow walk, but an enjoyable walk. It'll be a yeah. 15 minute walk. Um, and then have an uh, experience on the side, walk through the building, see how it will look like. I'm excited about it because the Shark Cage program, you know, the young entrepreneurs, they are actually having a commercial kitchen set up for their uh, food products there. So I want to see the kitchen. Oh. And, um, <laughs> hey, I paid for college for cooking. It is just under commercial grade because <laughs> just under. So it has all the stainless steel, beautiful appliances, and all that. Uh, we didn't quite go the full commercial route because guess what's required in the full commercial route? Professional uh, health and sanitation. No. The exhaust, the fire yeah. suppression systems. That makes that was hugely more expensive. But yes, there's an entire space that is for the students that are in the uh, business side. And they'll have plenty of cooking surfaces and, and those kind of things. So I think, uh, as I said before, that is a 609 bed facility. It is 320,000 square feet of air conditioned space. It has a lot of common areas, study rooms, uh, etc. Uh, the design has been incorporated so that there's that center courtyard out in the front so that people can kind of, yes? Quick question, go back to the, the homes on 36. Do you guys approach the, the homeowners individually or how, what's your method of? Uh, absolutely. So there's, there's a couple of brokers that we're working with. They know that we're looking to buy those properties. So every once in a while we contact the owners in case you want to sell. You know, some, <laughs> folks are happy. some folks are happy there. They're not looking to move. But again, university is an ongoing concern. Right? People move out of areas. Eventually, like I said, with this gentleman, he didn't want to sell. He was living there. And they've been talking, this broker told me he'd been talking to that guy for 15 years. Wow. So since he was uh, 89. He didn't want to sell. He, he's actually, it's interesting because he was a little eccentric, uh, independently wealthy. Uh, he sold another property in, in northern Florida to somebody else for like $7 million. So the guy was didn't need the money. He's like, I just want to live in my property. I don't know. And you go in there, you look at those houses, and you're like, yeah. <laughs> look like a hoarder, you know. I mean, it's, <laughs> if I had that kind of money, I wouldn't be living in that space. I'll tell you right now. You know, I'd be looking at the ocean somewhere, <laughs> or the mountains, or the golf course. All right, last two questions, and then we wrap up. Yeah, my my question is more on the on the career end um, versus the, the stuff. So in in your line of work and in your path. Are you purely um, are are you purely an employee, or do you get to exercise that entrepreneurial yeah. options? I'm purely an employee of the university. Okay. Right. I don't I, I don't get to go buy one of those houses and sell it back to the university. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I will. <don't. laughs> yeah. I'm purely an employee. That would be a conflict of interest. Can we? Sorry. He's walking with us, so there's also a the chance to have a conversation with him on the walk. Um, let's cut this time for timing. Okay, let's look, let's look at the screen. For those who are unable to have a walk, gotta point this out. This is where we at. 
You can go up on 30th Street, you turn right, you turn right on College Avenue if you choose to drive, and you turn right here on Nova Drive. This is not the main entrance. This, you see the buildings here standing high, and there's this little tiny gravel entrance, construction entrance, if you want to go by car. We have enough time to do this as a walk and enjoy campus. Some of you might actually never been here in that area of campus, so that's a new thing for you. And we will convene again for 12.30 in this classroom. Okay? We had right now here. This, this is the Carlos Sanders building. What we're going to do is in five minutes, so everyone can do a bathroom break. Your laptops, your bags, you can leave them in the real estate office. You don't have to carry your backpacks with you the whole, for the whole walk. Yeah? Brian is here, I'm here, so we, can, we lock this whole thing up. Don't leave any valuables in this classroom. Food, yes, but not any valuables. What we're going to do is we're going to then ride a roundabout, passing the library, going through the student union building to the circle here. And then we zigzag through commons to meet at the construction entrance. All right? I have room for six. See you in five downstairs.